Yeah, so it's being recorded now. We just lost my one minute intro. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Robert, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thanks to everyone here for attending my talk. And very excited to present some of my work on liquid metals uh, from the past several years and their applications for soft thermal um, materials. So let's uh, go over the general breakdown of the talk, which is split into five talk or five parts. Uh, the first is the motivation of the work and the relevant background information. And the next three sections will be covering uh, different composite materials that I've investigated in this work. And finally, summing up with the overall conclusions for this work and future directions. So let's start with part one, the motivation and background on TIMS, uh, concepts in thermal resistance and liquid metals. So the overall motivation behind this work is to address some of the challenges of thermal management and microelectronics. Many of our everyday devices, such as our cell phones, our laptops, and even our automobiles, they all have some uh, type of semiconduct chi uh, semiconductor chip, much like the one that you see here. And during operation, these chips generate large amounts of waste heat, which uh, can be detrimental for the device integrity, causing devices to uh, fail over time, uh, or also reducing the overall device performance. And this is an issue that continuously needs to be addressed as these devices uh, continue to become smaller and more powerful. So the idea is uh, to use um, uh, in thermal management application to use thermal interface materials or TIMS uh, to help with the heat transfer. Um, and here are just a couple of examples of TIMS where you see a TIM pad placed directly on top of the device and a thermal grease or paste that can be dispensed and spread across the surface. Now, TIMS are critical for improving interfacial heat transfer in microelectronics. And uh, to give you an example as to how this functions, let's take a look at a typical cross-sectional view of a microelectronics package. Uh, here I have a few key elements highlighted, such as the uh, main heat generating source, which is the silicon dye. And uh, this heat is removed through the integrated heat spreader in the gray and the heat sink in orange. Now the TIM, uh, which is shown in blue, uh, typically goes in between these two interfaces. And the reason for this is if you look closely at the seemingly flat and parallel surfaces, they actually have some inherent microscopic roughness, which can lead to imperfect contacts and uh, cause uh, limitations in heat, uh, heat flow and also trapping air, which uh, is a poor thermal conductor. So the overall function of the TIM is to essentially um, uh, conform to these rough interfaces and uh, enable uh, improved heat transfer across the surface while also removing uh, these uh, air pockets as well. Thus, this improves the overall thermal resistance across these heterogeneous surfaces, yet the TIMs themselves also face some intrinsic thermal limitations. So the uh, structure of a TIM uh, typically consists of high thermal conductivity and often rigid materials dispersed in a soft matrix material. Uh, for the different types of materials, they have a wide range of thermal conductivity, such as the soft materials that typically consist of silicones or epoxies. Uh, they hover around 0.1 watts per meter Kelvin, which is pretty typical for uh, that these uh, polymer materials are an amorphous material. For the filler materials, they have a larger range of thermal conductivities in the tens to hundreds of watts per meter Kelvin. And uh, on the more extreme end, there's uh, materials like diamond or graphene that have excessively high thermal conductivities. So there's certainly a large palette of materials to choose from, yet in actuality, the TIMs themselves fall closer to this range, which is uh, around one to seven watts per meter Kelvin, despite having such high thermal conductivity materials. And this is due to thermal resistance, which can be sourced um, either from filler-filler uh, -filler contacts, which are point-like in nature and limit heat conduction across these interfaces, uh, the filler and matrix boundary where uh, high thermal conductivity and low thermal conductivity materials um, have thermal mismatching and also contact resistance. So TIMS are typically quantified uh, using a steady state thermal reference bar method, which is a fairly common technique used in industry. And here, uh, the working principle for this technique is uh, Fourier's heat conduction law. Uh, and this essentially measures the total thermal resistance of uh, the sample material, measuring the temperature gradient over a constant heat flux. And this resistance can be further broken down into uh, the resistance of the TIM itself uh, and also the contact resistance. And if the bond line thickness or the thickness of the TIM uh, across the sample interface uh, is known, then an effective thermal conductivity can be uh, expressed, which takes into account this contact resistance. 
This plot shown here shows a, uh, a basic summary of these two equations showing this linear um, correlation between the thermal resistance and the bond line thickness and also the contributions of the contact resistance magnitude. So knowing this, we want to find ways to improve the thermal resistance for uh, better TIM applications. So how can we address this? One way that is being explored in academia and also more recently in, uh, in industry is the use of liquid metals as an alternative TIM. And in this example, you can see uh, a recent commercial use of the liquid metal TIM uh, in the recent PlayStation 5 console using it to draw heat away from the CPU. Now these liquid metals are based off of gallium and gallium related alloys, uh, owing to the fact that they are non-toxic compared to mercury. They also have very low melting points at uh, room temperature or below while also retaining their metallic behavior. Uh, other words, being uh, electrically and thermally conductive. Now the thermal conductivity for these materials is certainly much higher than the polymers yet uh, fall under a more uh, intermediate regime since uh, they fall short compared to other high conductivity metals such as copper. Now, one of uh, the key features for these liquid metals is their rapid oxidation in air. Uh, and if you take a very close look at the uh, liquid metal surface, you can see that it's actually comprised of a very thin self-passivating uh, oxide layer uh, that covers the surface of the liquid metal and it can be sheared under, uh, it can be fractured under mechanical shear. And this um, essentially exposes the underlying liquid metal, uh, allowing it to react with air to form new oxides. And this can happen over and over again to generate new oxide content. Now, despite being so thin, these oxides are actually quite ro mechanically robust, enabling very complex structures to, to remain stabilized. So in this image here, you can see that these liquid metal droplets are actually completely self-supported by these gallium oxide layers. So this opens up new opportunities for um, liquid metals processing. Now, certainly there are many advantages to liquid metals, but also uh, many challenges that need to be addressed uh, to uh, enable their widespread use. And here I categorize this into one of two uh, categories, the spreading and reactivity of the liquid metals. So these liquid metals are a very low viscosity material, uh, flows as easily as water, and essentially applied between interface, there's a risk of it squeezing or pumping out of the interface uh, during temperature cycling. It's also uh, fairly difficult to spread uh, this liquid metal across certain surfaces uh, due to its incompatibility with certain materials. Uh, and also it's uh, high surface tension, which you can see with the liquid metal beating up on the surface here. As far as reactivity goes, the gallium uh, essentially uh, has a strong affinity for many transition metals and uh, is able to form uh, spontaneously room temperature intermetallic alloys. Uh, in this example, showing gallium uh, and copper mixtures that essentially form a gallium copper alloy at room temperature that may introduce unwanted properties for the tin. And also uh, the uh, contact of liquid metals onto aluminum, which is a fairly common industry material, is also detrimental due to this uh, process of liquid metal embrittlement, which causes aluminum to experience catastrophic mechanical failure and uh, causing it to corrode very rapidly. So these challenges certainly need to be addressed and how exactly can we improve these liquid metals or improve materials with liquid metal for not only TIMS but other soft applications. So in my PhD work, I explore some of the fundamental properties of liquid metal and assess their utility for developing soft composites that have tunable thermal properties. And I outline this in the following roadmap, which starting with the liquid metal that's been unmodified and oxidized, uh, these uh, materials can be augmented through the simple addition of air and oxide content, which yields a liquid metal based foam. Now this foam is certainly more spreadable than the liquid metal uh, and more easily patterned, but the air content, uh, as mentioned before, can drive down its thermal conductivity. So uh, what if instead of adding air, you can add high thermal conductivity particles when dispersed in liquid metal form these liquid metal based mixtures that have tunable thermal conductivity. Both of these foams and mixture composites uh, each have a liquid metal matrix, uh, which can be detrimental for certain metallic surfaces uh, when applied. So dispersing these high conductivity materials into a polymer matrix uh, leading to these silicone-based greases uh, can also uh, hinder the direct contact of liquid metal onto the substrate uh, while also enabling this hybridized filler architecture to occur. <laughs>
So the scope of this work will follow uh, uh, the following research thrusts, which include the composite uh, structure property relationships, uh, liquid metal wetting on uh, microparticles, and also the tunability of thermal properties. So with that, let's move on to part two, liquid metal-based foams. And first, I'd like to acknowledge my lab mate, Najam Shah, who is the co-first author on this work that was published in Soft Matter last year. So gallium-based foams is actually a recent composite material that's been studied. Uh, and the uh, nomenclature for this is owed to the fact that it has a very uh, porous and foam-like structure internally as seen in this cross-sectional image. Now the uh, liquid metal-based foams have many advantages, including lower surface tension, higher viscosity, which enable improved patterning and dispensing. Uh, it is also inherently less dense due to its porosity, which also subsequently lose, uh, lowers its materials cost from a economic perspective, uh, since gallium and indium are relatively expensive materials. Now, these researchers uh, would, who published this work in 2019 uh, had uh, called this uh, oxidized gallium indium alloy, and uh, they formed this material fairly easily through simple stirring and shear mixing in air. However, there weren't any uh, established mechanisms or description on how this process occurs. Uh, so this led to a few guiding questions in my work, which include uh, how or when does the foam formation occur in these liquid metals? And also what are the effects of gallium oxidation and air content uh, have on different liquid metal properties? So in my experimental setup, I use uh, elemental gallium for ease of solidification and also cross-sectioning. And here, this gallium is melted into its liquid state and shear mixed in, uh, in air to produce these uh, gallium foam-like structures. Now, uh, a few comments on the processing aspect of these materials is that uh, on the very surface of these materials under high-speed shear mixing, surface waves are generated, which provide uh, opportunities for air to get trapped into the liquid metal when these waves fall upon each other. And on top of these waves are these oxide islands, which I described in an earlier slide. And these oxides form and float on top of the surface while continuously fracturing and reforming when liquid metal is exposed to air. So what exactly happens to this oxide content that uh, piles up onto the surface? Well, if we take a close look at the cross section of uh, one of these gallium foams, you can see that there's a lot of uh, wrinkled internal structures that uh, essentially line the walls of uh, the air pockets. And here, these are the gallium oxide fragments that appear to internalize into liquid metal during high speed shear mixing. To better understand the formation of these foams, let's take a step back and look at traditional foam forming mechanisms, which is a very well established field. Uh, in this case, looking at aluminum based foams. So typically metal foaming mechanisms can occur in one of two categories, either direct foaming, where the uh, uh, gaseous species or air is injected into the molten metal forming these bubbles, or indirect foaming where a blowing agent that can produce a gaseous species is incorporated into a molten metal and uh, eventually this porous structure is formed. However, the literature states that simply adding the air bubbles is unstable in the liquid metal. And that is until some amount of solid particles are added and dispersed throughout the, the liquid metal uh, and these migrate to the interfaces between liquid and gas phases uh, and enable a stabilization of the gas species into the molten liquid. So essentially, these solid particles are necessary for the stabilization of air bubbles and molten metal. And essentially, we can take these principles and apply them to our gallium-based systems. So now that we know that these gallium-based foams can form, I want to know when these foams start to form during the shear mixing process. So here I investigate uh, a systematic uh, mixing time uh, for uh, uh, this foam production for different mixing times, starting with the as prepared gallium showing a relatively homogeneous cross section. And then uh, after several minutes of mixing, you can see that these gallium oxides so that crumble and wrinkle start dispersing into the liquid metal and uh, some onset of uh, these air pockets are observed around seven and a half minutes of mixing. Beyond this, we can see that around 10 minutes, the gallium oxide and also air content continue to grow and propagate. And around 30 to even up to two hours, uh, this porous foam-like structure is formed. Now, uh, keep in mind that uh, these different mixing times also cause very different internal structures simply due to the dynamical nature of the processing method. But nonetheless, having foam-like structures uh, can form when some critical oxide content has been reached. Keeping these mixing times in mind, let's look at a few 
uh, materials properties for the gallium after uh, dispersing some amount of gallium oxide and air content, specifically looking at the density, the thermal conductivity, and also some rheological aspects as well. Now, the density uh, for the initial mixing times appears to not change very much. And it's only after the seven and a half minute mark that they appear to continuously decrease with increasing mixing time. The thermal conductivity, however, continuously decreases as the mixing time increases. And this is not surprising since the gallium oxide and also the air content is a low thermal conductivity filler material. Now, something interesting is observed when looking at the uh, storage modulus and viscosity as a, mix, uh, as a function of the mixing time. And here around seven and a half minutes, it appears to increase due to the increase in gallium oxide content. However, there is a sharp drop in between the seven and a half and 10 minute mark uh, with uh, these oxides here uh, appearing to be repurposed or consumed to start stabilizing uh, the initial formation of air capsules in this foam, uh, with these air capsules now serving as a soft filler material that uh, continue to increase in volume fraction, thus also uh, increasing the storage modulus in viscosity. So based on this data and also some of the observations on uh, these liquid metal foam formations, it appears that there's a transition period uh, that occurs uh, when the foams start to stabilize. And this leads to uh, essentially a two-stage foam formation where uh, stage one is uh, the oxide particle accumulation stage where these crumpled oxides from the surface internalize into the liquid metal. Uh, and then after some critical content has been reached, uh, the uh, air bubbles that fold into the liquid metal start to become stabilized with these oxides um, essentially migrating to the gas and liquid phases. Now, uh, prolonged um, uh, shear mixing time uh, essentially increases the air and oxide content, but one major caveat for this um, processing method is that the onset times for air stabilization is highly dependent um, only uh, not only on the mixing speed, but also the overall geometry of the mixing setup. So uh, while this uh, seven to 10 minutes seems to be uh, unique to our case, uh, it can certainly be uh, different for other types of mi mixing setups as well. So the main takeaways for this is that the gallium oxides enable foam formation so long as some critical value of gallium oxide fragments have been internalized and in stabilizing these air bubbles. And both uh, the thermal properties are um, negatively impacted by both the oxide and also air content. In the future, it'd be prudent to study uh, more in-depthly the uh, structural aspects of these liquid metal foams uh, in order to understand their overall internal structure and also uh, porosity as well. Uh, and it, it would also be um, good to uh, have better size control uh, and shape control over the air bubbles uh, inside these liquid metal foams uh, in order to have more, uh, potentially more predictable materials properties. Uh, now let's move on to part three, liquid metal based mixtures. Uh, and this chapter is based off of two of my articles published in Advanced Materials and Advanced Materials Interfaces, which uh, funny enough happened to just be accepted this morning. So uh, very excited about that. Um, so let's start with the overall introduction of what I call liquid metal X uh, mixtures, uh, where the X is the desired filler material that is mixed into liquid metal. And here are just a couple of examples shown in literature with liquid metal nickel particles uh, that can form a printable ink or potentially magnetorheological fluid. Uh, and also the liquid metal and copper uh, mixtures that form these paste-like composites that also exhibit very high thermal conductivity. So these materials can be produced uh, fairly easily through a simple shear mixing process. So dispersing the desired filler particles at the desired filler uh, volume fraction into liquid metal uh, and uh, enables the formation of these paste or putty-like materials. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that because this is a shear mixing process that the oxides will continue to uh, form during the shear mixing, uh, internalize and also air can uh, be internalized as well. So in this liquid metal and tungsten mixture, uh, you can see in this cross-sectional view here that uh, air voids can still uh, form and get trapped inside of these mixtures as well. Now, as I mentioned before, there, uh, gallium has a strong reactivity with many different types of transition metals. And because many transition metals are also happen to be high thermal conductivity materials, what are some of the limitations of types of fillers that can be added to liquid metal? 
So to give you an example, let's take a look at the interactions between liquid metal and silver. And silver is a fairly high thermal conductivity material showing over 400 watts per meter Kelvin. And the way liquid metal is able to coat and spread across the silver substrate is through a process called reactive wetting. And in this process, the liquid metal can spread and coat the surface of, uh, of silver through the formation of this uh, silver gallium alloy in between this interface. And during this alloy formation, the liquid metal becomes consumed uh, in the process. So when mixing um, an, a, a large enough amount of silver particles into liquid metal, it actually completely solidifies and hardens into a brittle material, which uh, through this XRD characterization, we can index this to a uh, silver tooth gallium alloy. So uh, in this case, what are other potentially high thermal conductivity materials that can uh, also resist uh, liquid metal reactivity? So in my work, I investigate tungsten and also more recently silicon carbide, uh, where these materials remain chemically stable in the liquid metal and do not form uh, these reactive alloy species. However, since they do not undergo this reactive wetting process, they're also highly non-wetting towards the liquid metal. Uh, and yet they're still able to blend into liquid metal to form these paste-like materials. So here I want to know what are the general wetting mechanisms of liquid metal on non-wetting microparticles. And this work was conducted in uh, my previous paper in Advanced Materials where I investigate uh, single particle interactions with liquid metal inside of an electron microscope. So in this electron microscope with a focused ion beam uh, dual column, uh, I look at this particle that is suspended over a pool of liquid metal that has been oxidized and essentially look at the effects of the particle interactions with the oxide layer. So using the gallium ion beam can irradiate the surface of the liquid metal, which fractures the oxide. And here um, taking this particle and essentially dipping it into the oxide, uh, we can see that the oxides coat and attach onto the particle surface. And these oxide covered particles can then subsequently wet the liquid metal. And this is what I observe, where this white contrast material you can see is uh, indicative of this uh, gallium oxide uh, coating and taking this particle and subsequently immersing into liquid metal leads to a liquid metal wetting process. So these gallium oxide fragments essentially serve as an interfacial wetting layer on these non-wetting surfaces. And uh, this is not exclusive to tungsten and essentially explains a lot of the wetting behavior of these liquid metals on many uh, non-wetting or non-reactive surfaces. However, there are some limitations to this oxide mediated wetting. Uh, first being particle size. So here looking at uh, these mixtures that have different uh, volume fractions of particles uh, with increasing uh, particle fraction, you can start seeing a transition from liquid to paste-like state, eventually becoming more granular. Now, these smaller particles that were used, uh, in this case using tungsten, uh, appear to uh, have a, a shift towards lower volume fractions that uh, appear to be more viscous. And in this case, uh, due to the increased uh, surface area of these particles and the requirement of having oxides coat the surfaces of these particles to blend with liquid metal, uh, it appears that these smaller particles will have increased difficulty wetting and processing under this oxide mediated process. And this was also observed in other recently published works as well. And now another consideration is that uh, the surface texture of the oxide is also important in terms of uh, oxide mediated adhesion. So in this uh, work that was published in 2014, uh, the oxides here shown that to have a rough or wrinkled surface have a lower substrate adhesion uh, compared to if the oxide were to form in between the substrate and also the liquid metal interface. So these wrinkled oxides, which uh, during shear mixing uh, the liquid metal, um, the oxide fragments fall uh, more onto this former case of having rough uh, oxide um, surfaces. So these rough and wrinkled oxides tend to have a lower adhesion onto uh, the particle substrates and uh, very uh, vigorous stirring or agitation could potentially uh, strip off these oxides and cause a liquid metal to de-wet from these surfaces. Now to circumvent this uh, oxide mediated process, we can use metallic coatings to enable liquid metal wetting. So in this uh, instance, we uh, investigated 
silver coated silicon carbide, which uh, these coatings are typically produced through an electrolysis deposition process. And we can see that the liquid metal very easily coats the surface of these particles. And as expected, intermetallic species, these rod like materials start to form at the interface between the liquid metal and particle surface. Uh, essentially, the silver layer promotes a reactive wetting on liquid metal uh, for these materials without consuming the core material. Now, these uh, types of mixtures also exhibit very high thermal conductivities, which can be tuned uh, simply by adjusting the volume fraction. So in this case, looking at the pure liquid metal and uh, tuning the volume fractions up to about 40 volume percent, you can see that in the case of liquid metal and silicon carbide mixtures, uh, we can achieve a thermal conductivity of about 50 watts per meter Kelvin, which is roughly two times higher than that of the base liquid metal. And both the silver coated and uncoated particles were examined in this case, showing um, very similar thermal trends. And it appears that the silver coating uh, does not affect the overall thermal properties of these types of paste composites. Now, after a certain volume fraction, so in this case, beyond 40 volume percent, it appears that it starts to decrease, uh, likely due to the increase in oxide content and also particle-particle uh, -particle contact set in um, increased the thermal resistance. So overall, for these types of mixtures, uh, adjusting the particle fraction and also keeping in mind the type of oxide content that's generated can uh, essentially tune the LMX thermal properties. So a uh, quick summary of part three, these gallium oxides help facilitate liquid metal wetting on non-wetting surfaces with some limitations and also have very high thermal conductivity that's tunable for these paste-like mixtures. Uh, in the future, it'd be um, uh, interesting to study some of the wettability and tailoring the wettability for smaller filler sizes uh, to circumvent the need for oxide-mediated process and also explore uh, potentially mixed filler combinations. So uh, uh, replacing some of the non-reactive filler materials in the X portion with another functional material in, uh, in the Y portion. Uh, so simple replacement of, say, tungsten with a very small amount of nickel or copper particles it can potentially enhance its thermal properties or in, increase its functionality for different uses. Now let's move on to part four, silicone-based greases, also adapted from the Advanced Materials Interfaces paper. In recent years, hybridized fillers have been explored for soft, stretchable polymer composite uh, applications. And uh, in this case, taking advantage of the fact that we have the properties of the solid fillers, while also the deformability of the liquid metal fillers uh, to increase the stretchability or deformation. Uh, in this case, we looked at these multi-vase composites in an earlier work from our group uh, that combined the use of liquid metal and copper particles for TIM application. And these particles are dispersed in a PDMS matrix. While this composite essentially uh, uh, has a, a large increase in thermal conductivity around 10 watts per meter Kelvin for a polymer composite, uh, it suffers from a huge drawback in that the copper particles uh, completely react with liquid metal and it renders this composite uh, very stiff and brittle. Now, other researchers have been in investigating different types of multi-phase composites uh, that combine functional use of solid particles and also the deformability and conductivity of liquid metal particles. Yet, there are still a few knowledge gaps in terms of the thermal aspects for these types of composites, which include what extent the liquid metal would improve the thermal resistance and also the overall role of liquid metal wettability on the composite microstructure and how this affects the overall thermal transport. So here I developed a silicone-based grease as a dispensable tin material that consists of three components, a silicon carbide uh, particle filler that has a silver coating to enable improved liquid metal wetting, uh, and these materials dispersed into a silicone oil matrix. And essentially this leads to a very um, uh, reworkable material, which is the advantage of using silicone oil. And here in this SEM micrograph, you can see that the liquid metal can very easily coat the solid uh, particle fillers as well. And dispersing everything into a silicone oil matrix essentially uh, encapsulates the liquid metal to limit the overall corrosion uh, from occurring. And to demonstrate this, uh, we can look at a comparison between these liquid metal based paste, which go on top of an aluminum substrate. And after just a couple of hours, you can see a massive discoloration uh, and uh, overall transition from a ductile material to brittle material within a, a span of just a couple of hours. Uh, so this causes very catastrophic failure of the, of the aluminum. Uh, 
Conversely, looking at the silicone-based greases, we can see that even at room temperature application or at elevated temperature, upon removal of these greases, that the liquid metal doesn't have direct contact with the substrate, and the substrate remains relatively pristine and ductile as one would expect for an aluminum uh, substrate. So the silicone oil here appears to prevent the liquid metal corrosion on aluminum substrates. Now here, I also want to understand the overall role of these hybridized fillers uh, in improving the thermal resistance and subsequently thermal conductivity for these uh, uh, sample materials. Uh, so on our thermal reference bar method, we can apply uh, pressure onto these grease materials, which here in the schematic uh, showing uh, just a representation of what these fillers can look like, having solid filler particles with liquid metal coatings or liquid metal dispersed throughout. And having an applied pressure on these materials uh, essentially brings these fillers closer and closer together, and essentially uh, allowing the liquid metal to coalesce and bridge these particles together, thus improving the heat flow across these particles. So here I examined the thermal resistance of uh, several different types of compositions of the particle, liquid metal, and oil. Uh, ratio shown here uh, with the oil fixed at 50 volume percent and liquid metal and particle ratio is being adjusted. So the thermal resistance here is plotted against uh, an applied pressure and without liquid metal you can uh, see that uh, the materials here uh, not surprisingly have show the highest thermal resistance uh, which then decrease with increasing pressure as these particles are brought closer together and uh, have improved contacts. Now, with the subsequent addition of 10 volume percent of liquid metal, we can see a similar trend with increasing pressure, yet the starting thermal resistance value becomes much lower, and even more so with a 20 volume percent of liquid metal added. So if you take uh, uh, these results and uh, convert it to a, an effective thermal conductivity, you can see that the contribution of the liquid metal uh, substantially improves the thermal con uh, conductivity for these types of materials. And, uh, essentially, when we look at a wider range of compositions, starting with no liquid metal up to about 20 volume percent, you can see that uh, the effective thermal conductivity here can be measured uh, up to nearly 10 watts per meter Kelvin, which is substantially higher than that of the base silicone oil. Uh, when measured under th different thicknesses, we can also take into account the contact resistance of this sample material. And when we can subtract it uh, from uh, this uh, composition, uh, in actuality, the value is closer to 17 watts per meter Kelvin, uh, indicating that contact resistance in this case uh, played uh, a relatively large role in uh, affecting the thermal resistance for these material. Now, we see this case happen for the silver coated silicon carbide, but what about the uncoated silicon carbide where uh, you have um, the thermal conductivity values appearing to hover around two watts per meter Kelvin? And this comes down to looking at its microstructure. So here I compare both the uh, silver coated and uncoated particles uh, showing the uh, relative wetting regions on optical microscope. However, if we take a close look at the microstructure between these particles. Uh, we see that the silver coating enables a strong wetting of uh, liquid metal onto the particle surface. And under applied pressure, these particles are joined together, uh, essentially being mechanically sintered uh, through this liquid metal uh, serving as a bridging agent. Uh, however, for the uncoated case, since uh, these particles rely on an oxide mediated process, uh, the additional stirring during the processing method could potentially uh, strip off or remove some of the oxides and also de-wet the liquid metal from the surface while also uh, enabling some of the particles to remain partially wetted. So in this case, having a wetting layer is essential for enabling this liquid metal particle bridging to occur. So the key takeaways for this section is that applied pressure and liquid metal inclusions help with the thermal resistance. The silicone oil can serve as a protective barrier against liquid metal direct contact and having a re reactive wetting layer is necessary to connect the liquid metal coated fillers. Uh, in the future, uh, I would like to study the uh, overall reliability uh, of these types of silicone based greases in different environmental conditions and also explore additional activation methods for thermal bridging, uh, which one aspect of this is being investigated by another member of my group. So finally, we reached the last part, part five, the conclusion in future directions. Let's revisit the earlier research threats I presented in the beginning of the talk. Uh, related to the structure property relationships, the wettability of liquid metals on the microparticles, and also tunability of thermal properties. 
So what are the take home messages? So here the structure uh, very uh, uh, indeed uh, affects the overall properties of these materials, uh, showing that these uh, oxide contents enable the formation of these foam-like structures and enable the blending of non-wetting materials. And having a reactive wetting layer uh, in this case can enable this type of liquid metal bridged microstructure that improves the thermal resistance between uh, particles in this composite. As far as wetting goes, the liquid metal, which originally was hard to spread and difficult to wet on the surface, uh, with increased uh, oxide generation through shear mixing in air, or also through uh, attaching onto substrates, can lead to this oxide mediated wetting process. And uh, when a stronger wetting adhesion layer is necessary, then depositing a metal coating or some other compatible coating can lead to this reactive wetting process. As far as uh, thermal properties are concerned, uh, there's certainly a large amount of tunability in terms of the grease conductivity uh, mixtures from foams. And there's um, a, a large amount of um, values that can be adjusted based on the filler content or processing methodology. And these all appear to uh, be relatively higher than conventional tins as well. The overall research impacts for this work include the establishment of mechanisms for liquid metal foaming uh, through simple shear mixing in air, uh, also contributing to the growing library of materials that uh, serve as a functional material, but also resist liquid metal uh, reactivity. Here, I have the uh, first experimental observation of this oxide mediated wetting process, uh, shedding light on the overall role of liquid metals in improving the thermal resistance for these composites and uh, the role of modifying the particle surfaces and how they uh, tune the overall liquid metal wetting properties. In the future, there's certainly many directions I can take this work, but I'd like to first summarize uh, three directions that are in the more immediate future. Uh, first, looking at cross-linked PDMS, uh, PDMS, where taking the principles uh, we learned from these silicone-based greases that have a non-reactive silicon oil, uh, instead of replacing it with a low viscosity PDMS uh, and uh, creating uh, elastomer stretchable polymer composites through cross-linking and enabling this liquid metal bridged uh, structure to be enforced during the curing process. Uh, and this is work that is currently ongoing. Uh, the next is uh, expanding concepts of the liquid metal based foams and diving into what we call liquid metal emulsions, where we can stabilize a secondary fluid into the liquid metal foam by replacing the air that's contained in these cells with another fluid, which uh, here we've been able to demonstrate with silicone oil and also is currently in, under investigation. Uh, and along the lines of uh, liquid metal based foams, uh, to form more ordered structures, uh, it would also be uh, prudent to investigate uh, infiltration casting. In this case, looking at poly uh, polystyrene microspheres. Uh, so the current literature uh, typically uses sugar cubes for this template assisted liquid metal foaming uh, and essentially uh, infiltrating the liquid metal uh, through the sugar cubes and dissolving it in water. Uh, however, the sugar cubes are uh, fairly uh, disordered and don't have a uh, define particle structure, whereas using polystyrene, we can tune the particle sizes uh, for these liquid metal melts and uh, essentially dissolve the polystyrene in the solvent when we uh, need to sacrifice the template. In any case, these multi-phase liquid metal composites can be extended to a variety of applications, including 3D printing, electronic interconnect stretchable sensors, and also smart textiles. And here is a list of peer reviewed uh, journal publications during my time at ASU with the first uh, three papers that serve as a basis for this dissertation work. Now I want to spend a few minutes acknowledging the many people that have uh, helped me get this far in my education, starting with my graduate committee. So I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Conrad Bajkoczewski and Dr. Robert Wang for not only welcoming me into your group, um, just only a few years ago, it seemed like a lifetime ago, but um, I also appreciate your mentorship and your incredible patience with me as a student. Uh, I also like to thank Dr. Matt Green for uh, serving on my committee twice now and also uh, allowing us to use some of your equipment for our work. I also like to uh, thank Dr. Seth Tange for welcoming me into your lab as a master's student and uh, essentially being a strong uh, point of support for throughout the many years I've been here as a grad student. 
I'd like to thank my funding source and the Semiconductor Research Corporation uh, and ASU and our many collaborators, both from industry and also uh, academia as well. Next, I actually like to thank the Society of Asian Scientists and Engineers, which for those of you who don't know, I've been a part of this organization for uh, about as long as I've been in grad school at this point. And uh, it's been a tremendous experience working with so many talented and smart people uh, and essentially developing my leadership and professional skills in tandem with my academic skills. Uh, so here, uh, establishing such a wide network and, um, and having so many experiences, I, I feel that uh, SACE has played a very large role in my growth as a grad student. I'd like to also thank my many friends that I've met in grad school in uh, undergrad and also outside of school in general. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for being a part of my life and uh, helping shape me into the person that I am uh, and also uh, uh, allowing me to have a social life outside of grad school. So uh, thank you to everyone here, so many people to uh, to recognize and to name, uh, and a special thanks to my girlfriend, Christine, uh, who has been a very huge part of uh, uh, support for me in the last few years, uh, and especially the last couple of months in preparation for this defense. And lastly, I'd like to thank my family. Uh, it goes without saying that I could not have gone this far in life without you. And I, I just want to say that my, my parents immigrated from China um, with uh, very little education and uh, they spent a lot of time uh, working different service and restaurant jobs to enable my sister and I to go to college. Um, and that was their only aspiration. And uh, luckily we were able to make it through college. And um, uh, we also are very proud to be the very first STEM graduates in our entire family. So a uh, quick shout out to my sister, Jess, who recently graduated with her second bachelor's in nursing. So thank you to everyone uh, pictured here and also uh, not pictured here as well. And with that, uh, I'd like to conclude my talk here. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, clap. Uh, great job, Wilson. Uh, at this point, uh, the talk <laughs> over. Uh, we'd like to go ahead and um, open the floor for any <laughs> general <laughs> questions. Uh, Tony, I think there's a lot of background noise coming from you. If you could. Yeah. Um, at this point, we'd like to go ahead and just open the floor um, up to general questions from the audience. Hi, Wilson. This is Braden. Great presentation, man. Um, just, uh, I guess, like a few questions. So, great work on on the adding of the fillers. So, I'm just curious. So, you talk a lot about thermal conductivity. Um, are there other options for like enhancing the electrical conductivity or maybe adding in some like insulating materials to modify the electrical conductivity? I just want to kind of hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, and that's a great question. And I think that uh, for our work, we focused mostly on the scope of thermal conductivity, but for the materials that we use, especially with the liquid metal and tungsten mixtures, uh, there's certainly a lot of room to play with the electrical conductivity in these types of composites and also tailoring how they are patterned and dispensed into other insulating materials. So uh, that is definitely uh, an area that we can investigate in the future. Awesome, and then one, one follow-up question. So I know you mentioned a little bit about like wearable applications. What kind of applications did you have in mind? So these types of uh, paste materials, which can be more easily patterned or, uh, or dispensed could potentially be used in uh, printed um, stretchable conductors applied onto fabrics and garments and uh, used as sensing devices. And certainly there's a lot of work being conducted and uh, many other types of liquid metal groups on this area. Right, awesome. Great presentation, thank you. Thank you. All right, any other uh, general questions from the audience? Hey, Wilson, it's Aaron. Hi. Hi, um, what was your inspiration for this um, PhD project? Uh, so the duration for this, uh, this work um, is about a little over three years at this point. So uh, from start to finish, about three years of work. Gotcha. Uh, I actually had a question real quick. Uh, go ahead. Um, so it's, it's known a lot of, uh, a lot of CPUs and stuff to use a lot of the, 
the sort of thermal pace. Do you think uh, moving forward, the standard would move towards more liquid metal cooling solutions? And uh, what are the sort of the risks you see with that in mind? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I believe that there's certainly a shift right now in terms of industry use for liquid metals for uh, these cooling applications. Uh, right now, the main issues that uh, need to be addressed are some, some of the ones I outlined here, actually, uh, so essentially containment. So using a pure liquid metal, uh, finding ways to uh, essentially prevent it from leakage and short circuiting other components or corroding other metals. Uh, so that would be one direction. And also augmenting the liquid metal uh, for uh, improved spreading and uh, dispensing and uh, high volume manufacturing, that would be an important aspect to address. Yeah, that, that's sort of my worry with a lot of that of, of using the liquid metal in the cooling is the is the potential of leakage and the in the shorting of uh, components on the board. But uh, but yeah, great uh, great presentation. Thank you. Hi Wilson, this is Sonia. Hi Sonia. I had a question on: Are there any concerns with the size of? Uh, these like semiconductors shrinking, you know, everyone wants like smaller and smaller semiconductors. Is there any concerns with this sort of material um, in very, very tiny uh, sizes? Uh, so that's a good question. I, I think that there's certainly a lot of considerations when looking at the package size, since the devices themselves can continuously shrink uh, due to the improvements in processing and shrinkage of transistor sizes. But I believe that uh, when looking at the packaging and essentially how you encapsulate the, uh, the chip and uh, addressing the thermal issues with uh, that, I think is more of a packaging issue um, in, instead of a necessarily a device issue. Uh, but certainly there's a lot of room to explore um, either at the research level or commercial level. Got it, thanks. All right, great questions by the audience. Uh, any more? All right, then. Um, at this point, I'd just like to um, give the chance, the committee a chance to ask uh, our questions. And so uh, could the audience uh, please uh, give Wilson one last clap and then excuse yourself? Thanks, everyone. <laughs>